Good morning. Get the house lights up a little bit so I can see who I'm talking to. How's everyone doing? Great. You guys all excited about the pumpkin thing? I know I'm not. <laughs> Just kidding. It's going to be fun. <laughs> fun is all relative these days, huh? It's... Hey, so glad you're here. I'm going to be speaking about Jesus' honesty with people today. You know, you may not always like what he says, but it's the truth. You may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. Jesus was a man of integrity and a friend who will always be faithful. He's the counselor whose insights will never prove false. When Jesus expresses an observation or issues a warning concerning a person or any particular situation, he can always be counted on for pinpoint accuracy. When Jesus promises, he can be counted on to deliver. He will never withhold from you what is needed for your spiritual growth. And that can be a bummer sometimes, but he won't withhold it. And if he reveals something in us, it must be essential for our life to deal with, even if it's painful and demanding. And yet, it is with ease that Jesus can touch people's hearts even when he can be demanding, even when he can call us on stuff, he has the ability to reach people. And the reason I believe he does is because he loves them. I believe when Jesus walked the earth and people talked to him, he looked them in the eyes. He listened to what they said. But the amazing thing about him is that he can go to the heart. He knows the motives and the painful places and the wounded places. He knows why people do what they do. And so he had the ability to show love, but also speak truth to issues in their lives. Sometimes they received it, sometimes they didn't. But there was an attraction to him by people. And we're at this place in the Gospel of Luke where some people who have been following Jesus, one of them, Jesus says, come and follow me. And the other two say, we want to follow you. And he looks at them, and he deals with an issues or some issues in their lives that even though they profess they want to follow, there are issues that hinder them from following. And they're the same issues that we will deal with in our following of Jesus, in our understanding of Jesus. We have ideas of how Jesus ought to operate. We have plans that get in the way of following Jesus. We have hurts from the past that we look at him with skewed eyes. There's lots of things, and Jesus has the ability to deal with that and to give us opportunity to walk with him. Now, in the, the setting the scene, Jesus earlier had spoken to his disciples in this same chapter 9 that he was going to go to the cross. So up until that time, he was doing all kinds of stuff out in the world, touching lives, miracles, casting out demons, doing that, drew the apostles to him. But in this particular time, he tells them, I am going to go to Jerusalem. And so he does some teaching to his disciples and revealing some things in their hearts that were problems in their lives and problems in following him and loving them at the same time. There was no condemnation in him. There was just that this is an issue in your life that needs to be dealt with because I want you in the game for the long haul. And these things will take you sideways. And so, but it, today it changes. The disciples are walking with them and they're going from the northern Galilee, northern part of Israel, down along the western side into a land of Samaria, which was a hated area. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. It was a real racial issue. And we talked about that the other week. But Jesus loved those people. And so he sent his disciples. Well, while he's walking and dealing with them, it gets quiet. 
And he starts to deal with some other people who want to or are thinking about joining Jesus. So we pick up the scenario in Luke chapter 9, verse 57. And it says this, as Jesus, or as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. He made a statement. He must have been close to Jesus. They might have been talking. He, and Jesus looks at this man, and he knows what's in his heart. He knows why he said it. You know, sometimes we say things and don't know why we say it. Has anybody ever had to say, you say something, and then you're picking up the pieces afterwards? Jesus never had that problem. When he said something, it was thoroughly thought out. It was insightful, and he knew what he was talking about. And he says to this man, but Jesus replied. We're going to see a lot of buts in this next number of verses. But is a conjunctive word, conjunctive word. That's a big English word. I just, I had to look up, see, what, what is conjunction? Mean? I can barely do second grade math. And uh, he a conjunctive word is a word that nullifies the statement that was just made. It contradicts it. This man said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, but there's a problem here. Looking at your heart, looking at what you're about, there's a hitch in the giddy up. And he says this, but Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. He made a statement. Nature has homes. Everything in nature has a home of some kind that they go to. And then he says this, but again, I'm going to change the, I'm going to contradict this statement. The son of man, speaking of himself, has no place even to lay his head. He's saying, I understand why you want to follow me. I'm bringing the kingdom of God. I've been telling people I'm a king. And you think that's going to provide you some great security. But let me tell you where I'm heading. Where I'm going, and these next number of months I am heading down there, I am going to be going to towns. This guy doesn't know this yet. I am going to be going to places and there's really going to be no place for me to lay my head. You think following me is going to provide you an abundance of security. How many have ever thought that about following Jesus? How many thought that following Jesus, everything was going to go smooth from here on out? I'm heading up the hill now. It's a beautiful ride. Jesus says, listen. Don't follow me because you have preconditions of what that's going to look like. He didn't tell this guy, you're not going to have a house. And by experience, most of us know following Jesus, we still have homes. We still have families. We do work. We live a pretty normal life if we walk with him. There, lot, stuff happens, but we have a life. He wasn't telling the guy, this is what you're going to have. He's telling the guy, I'm not going to have this. So your immediate priest, you know, your belief that it's going to be great is, and you'll be in Jesus' kingdom here on earth. He goes, that's not what's going to happen. Are you still good to follow? You know what's the biggest enemy to following Jesus? Security. Security. We want to be secure. I want to follow you, Jesus, but I want to make sure it's secure. And secure in my own way of thinking what's secure. Problems will be kept out. Things will go well. I won't have to worry. And Jesus popped that bubble. Your security has to be in Jesus. I remember one of the most pivotal moments in Teresa and Myla's life when this is 35 years ago, no, about 33 years ago, before we ever got into ministry, we sat in our bed, and I've shared the story with some of you before. We sat in our bed, and we, wrote a, we made a contract with God. 
This was after I got sober, after I got clean, after I got, you know, walking with Jesus. I was involved in ministry and some uh, overcomers, 12-step type stuff. And I said, you know, I wrote it out. We will follow you, kind of like what this guy said. We will follow you, but you have to take care of us. And we both sat there at the bed, and we signed our names to it. And I held it out, and Jesus appeared, and he took it. (laughs) It was quite the experience. (laughs) I had dropped acid the night before, so it seemed right. (laughs) That's horrible. Who's... Did that come out here? <laughs> anyway, um, we put it in an envelope, and, and I put it in, uh, and I actually found it a few years ago, but we made that decision that our security would be in God, and we would serve however God wanted us to serve, and we didn't know what that looked like. We just were gung-ho to do it, and uh, I had enough faith to do that, and then, see, faith is incremental. We have to have some faith to even come to the Lord, and even to have faith, God puts it in us. But then it's a whole nother thing to walk in that because worry is one of our big problems. This guy was very concerned about security, and Jesus called him on it. He said, your security can't be in anything there. It has to be in me. It has to be in me. In fact, Matthew 6, says that. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Jesus is speaking here. He says, seek the kingdom of God. Make it a first priority and live righteously. Live right. That's what the word righteously means. Live right with the people God puts in your life. And he will give you everything you need. And that everything is everything. You need work on the inside, he'll give you that. You need something to change in your life, he will make your life uncomfortable. He will take things away. He will do what he needs to do, but he will give you everything, including this material things, to live. He didn't, you know, unless you're that one in a million person that he calls to live in some type of environment that is, you know, way out there. And that's what oftentimes scares us in following Jesus. It's like if I follow Jesus, he's gonna put me in Timbuktu. And I'm going to be in a place where I never want to go because I've been told that my whole life. If you follow Jesus, everything that's fun, no. Everything you don't want to do, yes. It's not like that. You will fit. It will fit you. He's designed you from the womb for that. It's in you. You just have to discover that. He says, listen, everything you need, so don't worry about tomorrow. Well, how many of us violate that all the time? How many of us know the Lord and violate that all the time? We worry, and worry can throw us off because it consumes our minds. When I'm worrying, God is really far. He's far away. When I am grateful, it brings him close. He says, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Just deal with today. And again, Jesus did not say, you're not going to have a place to lay your head. He's saying, I'm leaving here in a number of months. You don't know this yet, but I'm going. And whether I'm here or not, you still have to follow me. Our great challenge is we don't see him, but we know he's doing something. So, Jesus is walking on, and in verse 59, he says, he says to another person, come follow me. First guy asked and says, I'll follow you. He made a will statement, I will follow you. This guy is walking along. Jesus looks at him and says, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, there's the but which disqualifies the statement previously made. Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. First of all, I can't think of a greater honor or show of love or expression of including and acceptance than the fact that Jesus would bid anyone, the God of all creation, put on human flesh, would bid someone to come with him. You can't can't get greater acceptance than that. 
You can't get greater honor than that. The only thing more astonishing is that someone would reject that for something else. He said, I will follow you, but not right now. He says, I have to go home and bury my dad. His dad didn't die. His dad most likely was not even sick or he would have been asking Jesus to heal him. And if his dad did die, he would have been observing the 40 days of where you, your family lives is in isolation, mourning that death and all the other things that would take place in the passing in, in Israelite society. What he is saying is, I want to follow your mission, Jesus. I, I want to. I, I really do. It's in here. But I have a mission, too. And at this point of my walk, that mission is more important. My father's business, my, my family stuff, I have to do this. He did not realize, and neither of these three guys realized, that Jesus was asking them to follow him for a short period of time. Because in the next chapter, the beginning of of chapter 10, right after this, these encounters, he picks 70, some versions say 70, a couple versions say 72, disciples to go out and do amazing things, to go out on a missionary journey to all the cities, all the towns that Jesus was going to visit on his way to Jerusalem. They would cast out demons. They would heal the sick. It was an adventure of a lifetime. This is the thing with walking with Jesus, my friends. We don't know what's next. We don't know. We don't understand. The first guy thought that the kingdom would be something that Jesus would be king of, take over the Roman government, move all the bad guys out, move all the good guys in, and, and rule. And that he, by being with the king, would have some kind of worldly stuff, uh, commiserate with that position. Jesus said, no, I didn't even got a place to put my head. This guy says, I'll follow you, but first. How many of us do that? I'll follow you, but I first got to get my, it's a security issue again. I got to get my security in place. I have to have enough money. I have to have enough this. I have to have enough that. I've got these other things I'm very concerned with. And so, I want to do things your way. I see it all the time in relationships. Somebody will come in single, um, loving the Lord. God's changed a big chunk of their life. They're moving in a direction, and all of a sudden they meet Mr. Wright. <laughs> Mrs. Wright. Miss Wright. She's, hopefully she's not Mrs., but. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I don't see him for six months in church. They want to follow Jesus, but it's really important they please this person. This person comes before him. And if this person dictates certain things, that is really important. What this guy's dad felt about him following Jesus was a big deal to him. It was a decision. It was, you know, I, I, maybe I should just do it with him till he dies. I won't get any negative feedback. I won't be known as a Jesus freak. I won't be known as the guy that, is, and if he was Jewish, going against that culture, he would be ostracized. If I start following Jesus, this is going to cost me greatly family-wise. So Jesus calls him on it. But Jesus told him this, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. What does that mean? He said, listen, you are spiritually connected. You are so attuned spiritually that you can go out right now and talk about the kingdom of God. I don't know how much he knew. I don't know any of the dynamics of that. But Jesus looking at him and says, you're spiritually connected. He says, why would you want to go to things that are dead spiritually and pour yourself into that. 
You know what you're going to be, my friend? Conflicted. You're going to be conflicted. You're going to have one, ha- one foot in here and the other foot in there. He says, let those who aren't spiritually connected chase after all the things that don't bring spiritual awareness, spiritual prosperity in your life, connection to God. Why would you want to do that when you have a call? I am calling you to a whole new way of life. And then he tells them this, your duty. This is your duty. This is what I have designed for you. And yet you want to go back to stuff that didn't do anything for you. See, some of us go sideways from walking with God because there are things in our life that are dead, Maybe relationships from the past, maybe wounding from the past, but we spend so much time ruminating about it. So much energy ruminating, we don't have any room for the spiritual. We're so worried about the future, worried about setting ourselves up career wise, worried about this, worried about that. He goes, Let the people that don't know God worry about all that. That's what that's their only hope. He says, your job is to help them see something else, not be in it with them, not living the same way, full of the same worries they have. You guys following me? I remember when I was, you know, after I got saved and clean, I was driving a beer truck for another four, almost four and a half years, you know. I lived one way before I knew God with the beer guys and the city of Huntington Beach and all that stuff. And then when I came to know God and got spiritually connected, God didn't take me out of that environment. He might not take us out of the environment, but he will use us in that environment to be a blessing. And I'm not talking about being the blessing where you're sitting at your desk and now that you got Jesus, you put your Bible out there for everyone to see. And you flip during lunch, and you're looking at it, and then you're judging everybody on their lifestyle. I'm being a light. No, you're a being a jerk. <laughs> I'm talking about living in such a way in the midst of death that you bring spiritual connection. They notice by the way you live, there's something different about you. You go through the same trials we go through, but you deal with them differently. You're not pulling your hair out over everything. You're, 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 you know, you're, you're dealing with stuff. That's what he's called us to be. He said, you need to go not in the mix. You need to be in your world, but you need to be a light. And by the way, I'm calling you right now to a special thing you don't know about that is going to be the adventure of your life. So don't go there. Keep following me. Then, well, okay, let's move forward. You know, following Jesus is a now thing. It's not a later thing. But first is the same thing as not following. So, Jesus had a future and a new purpose for this man's life, and he offered it to this man. Jesus does not want the man to miss the opportunity of his lifetime. You know, when we put things first in front of Jesus, what we oftentimes will have is regrets. I just wish. I've known many guys, like when I went to the mission from driving the beer truck, I went with a huge pay cut. And Teresa and I often talk about today is like, we have more money today than we ever had in our whole life. We can go out to dinner pretty much whenever we want. We can buy the kids new shoes if they need to. It's, it's, we're in a different world. When our kids were growing up, it was mainly hand-to-mouth and hand-me-downs. 
We, you know, so when we chose to follow Jesus into that arena, we took a huge cut. And I know guys throughout my journey with the Lord that said, I would love to follow Jesus. I would love to be in ministry full time. But I got all these things I have to take care of. And you know what they've told me years later? I'm so bummed I didn't do it when I was younger because I knew, because I, I went into ministry at 33 and a half years old, and I've been in it since. And uh, I, I, I remember people telling me, man, I wish I would have done that because I had that call too. But I thought, I thought I needed to establish all these things so that I could do ministry. And I get it. I go, yeah. I think I was stupid enough <laughs> to just go, to just go and believe God would meet our needs, both Teresa and I. It's one of the, you know, and so we laugh, think, you know, thinking today of where we were and where we're at now, and, and, and I've only been in ministry. It's not like I've had seven other jobs. I mean, I worked part-time. I was bivocational. I did things to bring money into the house, but the focus was stay the course. Listen, all you ever have to do is follow Jesus now. Whatever he's speaking to you, which takes us to the third guy. Still another guy in verse 61 said this, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Well, that's harsh. That's harsh. What's going on? All the man wanted to do was go back and say goodbye to his family, but that wasn't what Jesus was asking him to do. Jesus had in mind a short missionary trip. What this guy had in mind was going back to his family. I will be serving the Lord now. I want everybody to know I am really laying down my life for Jesus. I would like the family to hold a party, ascending away. He wanted a production. Jesus got it. He wanted glory in the job. Jesus looked at him and said this. He said, you know, no one who puts their hand to the plow, he's using a uh, an agrarian, you know, example, which everybody there would know is an agrarian society. No one who gets behind a steer pulling a plow, cows pulling a car, even whatever tractor's pulling the, the plow, no one gets behind that and looks back. See what I'm doing? Everybody appreciate it. Why am I pulling so much? This is hard work right now. Does everybody see what I'm doing? Yeah, I'm serving I could use some attaboys here, atta girls. He's, first of all, he says, listen, plowing is only a little part of the season. You don't plow all year long. A farmer doesn't go out and plow and then plow and then plow and then plow. He goes, plowing is the start. In fact, the word put your hand to the plow is a Greek expression that they used back then to begin he says, you want to follow me, you have to begin. You have to do something. You have to start. And he says, and when you plow, you don't look back. You're looking to the destination of where you're plowing. It's not a destination forever. You're coming to the end of the field. But what happens when you look back is the plow goes in the direction. We have the, ten, you know, have you ever driven a car? Where you tend to look, the car tends to steer. It's the same thing plowing. And he says, listen, when you plow what you do and you're looking back, you waste field. There are so many rows a farmer wants to get in a plot of land. And when you go off, you just jacked up the plan. You just took out, you wasted a bunch of time in a direction that didn't accomplish. Either you got to come back, fill it all in and replow, or else after that, you plow everything off. 
So you're messing up. After the plowing, you have the sowing of the seed. Then you have the nurturing of the plants. Then you have harvest time. There is a season for everything. So he knew this guy wanted to come, but he said, ah, the problem with this guy is he doesn't want to start. He thinks he's got a big picture. One of the complaints older people always have with younger people is that younger people always want to start out at the top. I want to be paid a lot of money. Yeah, but you've never done this job before. Do you know who I am? I am an important person. Yes, you are, but you don't know nothing about the business. This guy thought he was going to start big, really, really large. Jesus said, no, just put your hands to the plow and let's start with a furrow. Let's go straight for a distance. Why? Because Jesus knew the next thing I'm going to have is sending out people. Next thing I'm going to do is send out some people. I don't want you to miss the opportunity. And it's one of our greatest problems in following Jesus is we think we're going to miss an opportunity. You know, when I was younger, I don't know if you guys were ever like this, but when some, you know, if you came to me in the morning and said, hey, Joe, you want to go out tonight? The answer is, Maybe, because there might be a better offer like two hours later. I thought not committing was a plus, was a good thing to do, not realizing that you only advance through commitment. Anything that works takes commitment. And failing is part of growing, is part of getting a readjustment. Jesus wanted this guy to experience something great. And this guy wanted to have a, 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 a going away party for a three-week venture. It's like he probably went away longer on business. He didn't have a big party when he went away on business. But doing this little thing for Jesus was going to require big stuff. Which takes us to Luke 10. Luke 10 tells us this, which is a sad story for those three. The Lord, verse 1, now chose 72 other disciples. They didn't go. They didn't go on the adventure of their life because they were stuck in different areas of their life and couldn't follow him right away, even though what he would have them do was of short duration. He says, you can't, if you can't follow me now, you, you're not following me. When you say I'll follow later, that's the same thing as not following. He wants to spare us of that, but it's a big faith issue. Start with what's in your hand already. What is God already? How, some of us sitting in here right now. God, we know there's some things we need to deal with, but we're just not ready to get started. But first, Jesus, I would love to follow you wholeheartedly, and I will once my husband gets on board. What does that have to do with anything? You follow Jesus, or vice versa. I would love to do this with you, Jesus, but... What I just said, I'm contradicting now, and I'm giving you the reason why I can't. It says he chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. All three guys, and we'll look at what takes place with these 72 others next week. All three guys missed out on the adventure of their life. You know what, you guys? I don't want you to miss out on the adventure of your life. Any more, any more. Some of us in here have lived with a lot of regrets, a lot of regrets. And I know sometimes in recovery says, you know, no, don't worry. Your regrets aren't regrets. They got you to here. And there's truth to that. But there's also loss to it. Amen. There's also loss by not choosing other ways to do life. 
Don't wait any longer. And all you and I have to do is now. You will, if you follow Jesus, you will embark on an incredible journey. And that journey takes you to the next now. So everybody in here has got a now they're dealing with. There's something in your hands you're dealing with. I say follow him in that right now. If he wants to go deeper in you and he wants to reveal some things, if, then allow him. If he wants to heal some things, then allow him. If he wants you to start something that you keep wanting to, but you find all the excuses in the world to not do it. I, one of the biggest things I deal with in helping people in recovery is to start a career. Well, I don't know anything. I, 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 I can't go to school. I, I, I just can't go. I, you know, I was horrible in school. Yeah, 99.9% .9 of addicts and alcoholics are not good students. We get it. We're not good students in life. We're not good students in school. We're not good students in relationships. We're just not good students. We're the rebel kids. Stop being the rebel kid. What do you want to do? What is it that God has put in you? What is a stir? Well, I don't know what it is. Well, pray about it then. But don't just pray about it. Be willing to do something new. Oh, I want to have a relationship, but I've been so hurt in relationships that, you know, I can't go into another relationship. Well, deal with the hurt. What, did, what happened? What would you do in it? What's your part? Because if you go into another relationship, guess what? You take you. So deal with you. Start that process which makes you better to deal with the other relationship, the next relationship. What is it? Deal with it. Yeah, but it's painful. <laughs> All growth is painful. All growth is painful. And on and on and on. You know, we're, in fact, a few people I prayed for today, I, I could just tell, I could see in my spirit that God was turning a page in their life. Either they turn the page, you know, we're either moving forward or we're going backward. Human beings are not stagnant beings. We are getting older by the minute. We are moving forward. Emotionally, though, we can move backward. Relationally, we can move backward. And if we're not moving forward in relationships, we're moving backward. If I am not handling things, I am mishandling things. We are salient beings, which means we move. None of us can stand still or stagnant very long. In fact, how many know that you, what, what's the worst place to be? Stuck. Stuck is a horrible place to be. Usually when we're stuck, God either wants to do something now in us, and he doesn't want us to move, because people with itchy feet, he will cement them down somewhere. Or he wants to move us into something new and we're unwilling to start. So our security issues can be a problem to following God. Bottom line is you got to put your security in Jesus. If you put your eternity into him, you may as well put the now into him. Oh, I trust him to take me to heaven, but I can't trust him with what's going to take place next week. Once he fumble and bumble through that. Because that's what really what you're saying. Security, dead things. You know, some of us have some dead things that we, we've buried, but we keep digging them up. Oh, I bury my worry. God, take my worry away. Where is that worry anyway? <laughs> I know where it is. I got to dig it back up because something new happened and worry's my go-to. Oh, it's completely dead to me. It just takes me into a bad spiral, but I'll go there. You're spiritually connected. And we have an idea how God's going to do stuff. Don't miss out. Recognize that, okay, when those things happen. You know, everything in Scripture is given to us for our edification, which means to build us up, to help us. These people are like us. And this is the beauty. I don't have to follow them today. So... Why don't we stand up? I want to pray for you guys, for the, you guys that. How many, you don't have to tell us what it is, know that God wants you to deal with something now and you're just kind of hesitant to get started?
Well, I guess we don't need to talk about anybody else then. <laughs> How many have other things that keep getting you messed up in walking after Jesus? Other worries, other stuff that just takes the place. Dead things. Okay. What's the other one? <laughs> you don't know either? Thank you for listening. How many are thinking about lunch right now? <laughs> All right, let me pray for you. Lord, you know, you know each one of your kids here. You have done things in their life, whatever that is, to bring them to this place today. So they have found something attractive about you, either through someone, through, through situations, what you've done before in their lives. But each one of us is on the precipice of doing something new in you. You are a forward-moving God. You are a God who increases our capacity and capabilities in our generation to be a blessing. So I pray right now that their faith will not fail them. I pray that they will trust you. And if it is to start, that's the thing that just keeps sticking in my head, doing start something new. Whether it's inside them, whether it's a fear that has held them back, Whatever that is, whether it's stuff from the past that has caused them to not move forward, I pray that they would have the willingness. And if it's something that needs to be buried, that has been dead to them, it's of no value, that they would bury it and then look to something new, even though it be scary that their trust in you would be enough. So, Lord, bless my brothers and sisters today. Continue to guide them and direct them. Continue to move in their lives. Continue to build their faith wherever it needs to be built so that they may go further in the adventure you have for them in our generation. And give those especially who have been reluctant to put their hand to the plow, to start. Give them the hope to start anew. And all of those who agree, say amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day and see you in there.